Are going to change your syllabus a little bit eventually. Uh, we have two sessions and one, uh, on audit analytics, one <laughs> session is on big data. And I'm going to, I already had some guest speakers there, I'm going to change them a little bit, but I'm going to have several of them come and talk to you so when you get to the profession, you are ahead of everyone. Okay, and actually, I already changed it for next week. Uh, next week, not next week, tomorrow. Is it tomorrow? Yes, tomorrow. Um, we have a speaker from Citibank coming in. Actually, it's two speakers. And these guys are big in the sense of things. They are head, they are the heads of the audit analytics part of Citibank's. Uh, so you're going to hear, and I asked them to show you, I hope they do, show you a couple of things that they showed for me and to Hussein. I don't know if you know Hussein, it's Professor Issa, and he was one of our PhD students two years ago as we hired him. And he's now mainly in New Brunswick in the government accounting area. Uh, but he's doing incredibly interesting work uh, with uh, open data. Do you know what open data is? Is This is a very big motion in many governments of putting government data available to the world in the open. And this morning I was talking to Steve Kozlowski, who's doing a dissertation with us, and he listed to me like 20 different places that are doing open data, including city of New York, Las Vegas, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And actually, Las Vegas, they have a checkbook file. And what the checkbook file is, is every check, supposedly, that the city of Las Vegas wrote and a record or electronic record of it that you can analyze. So it's very interesting uh, what the open data thing is. And Hussein is going to come here tomorrow and not talk about open data. We, uh, I'm going to get someone to do that. Probably Denise more than Hussein. Uh, but what we're going to do, to, Hussein is going to do tomorrow before the Citibank presentation is talk about exceptional exceptions. And that's his, his dissertation two years ago. And uh, just, I think in one capsule, I can explain what he did. When you have a big data receptacle, okay, let's say you have a million records, or 10 million records, or 100 million records, if you pull a sample, like you're supposed to pull in auditing, the sample means nothing. You pick up 70 records. What does that represent, 100 million records? So Hussein's dissertation was he called exceptional exceptions. So you pull uh, some kind of method that tells you the importance of the exceptions. Because you can't really give to an audit department 100,000 records to examine. You can give them 200. So Hussein developed two methods to do exceptional exceptions. And since then, we have been doing exceptional exceptions in everything. Actually, we, before Hussein uh, started his dissertation, we had a PhD student called Young Bam Kim that actually did exceptional exceptions, but he didn't call it that way. He gave everything the weight of one. And who, what Hussein perfected it, he changed the weights. And you're going to, after our analytic lectures, you're going to have no problems understanding what I'm talking about. Um, but Hussein will come tomorrow before the uh, the Citibank lecture and talk for half an hour to you about exceptional exceptions. And I, I will change the syllabus also to put something about open data there, about government and about what we call uh, open data armchair audit. What the armchair audit is, is a, the words of the British Prime Minister uh, talking about putting public data, putting data of federal systems or state systems in an open data format, meaning that anyone can access. Uh, and then all of you can be armchair auditors. You can go into there and without being part of any audit firm or etc., review that data. And that very has very interesting consequences and unintended consequences. Um, meaning there are things that you don't expect that's going to happen. Uh, we had a guy here in our conference, and he is um, a resident of one city in New Jersey. 
So he asked for all the data of the police department of New Jersey, and after a lot of hassle, he got it. And uh, he claims that, that his kids were stopped in the street by policemen, in harassment, and etc. Uh, but what he wanted to do is show that there was, that made no sense his community to have its own police force, but needed to have was inefficient. And he and uh, seems that he so he uh, that he proved it to the point that the police force was merged with another police force. So this idea of kind of open data on the public domain <laughs> is a very powerful idea. And guys, this is an audit idea. Here is things, accounting idea and audit idea. The reason you put data in the public <coughs> domain is for other people to review that the resources that you are paying in your taxes are being well used. We have actually a second little project that we are doing that is open data for uh, the Brazilian uh, government's federal <laughs> expenditures. So what they have there, we found out, is 470,000 contracts by Brazilian government. And it's open data, so we managed to, after struggling with it, download it. You are working on that, aren't you? Chow is working on that. And what we are trying to do is develop little applications to check for certain problems with that data. For example, vendor concentration. For example, bidding at different prices. Uh, for, the, for example, false bidding. And they came up with a list of maybe 40 different tests that you could run, and of course then we discovered that many of the tests could not be run because the data wasn't appropriate to that. But this is a tremendously leading edge uh, kind of thinking, and the U.S. government is creating an open data act, whereby, the, and the, by the way, the U.S. government has a couple of thousand of data sets in data.gov and they have a couple of other of these open data locations. So what's happening very interestingly is that this epidemics of open data distributed city of New York, um, Las Vegas, state of California, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, this is going to have very interesting consequences, some intended, some not intended. For example, I have the impression that many governments are going to open data, but the data that will be available won't be good enough to do analysis. So, uh, because you know, who wants to be examined? When, when students ask me, uh, why, do, why don't public companies like to disclose anything more than financial statements? I say, who likes to be graded? Correct, you're a CEO of a company. Do you really want to be evaluated on your in inventory turnover ratio per division? Do you really want to evaluate that your personnel <laughs> turnover or your personnel capacitation or your, uh, maybe your patents, your intellectual property? So obviously companies don't like it. Of course, companies also think that by giving information out, they're impairing their competitiveness. And there is some truth to that. There is some truth to that, but it's a public good thing. Just for you that are so young, um, in, uh, you know, the U.S. had a big depression, and after the, the depression, there was a Security Act of 33, 34, and that act basically required companies to be audited if they were publicly listed, because before that, there were companies that didn't exist and had stock in the stock market. And part of that was a whole requirement of balance sheet and income statement. Sounds reasonable, correct? Right? Ah, companies hated the idea of disclose their income. Do you understand why? Why? Again, again, if you're competing with other companies, it allows them to benchmark exactly where you That's are. That's right. You don't, first, you don't want to be graded. You don't want to be comparison. Second, you don't want other people to know that you're making a bundle of money because they'll come and compete with you. So if you're a supermarket and making 1% on your sales, no one will come in your direction. But if you're all company and making 70% on your sales, people will try to go into that business. So, you know, today sounds preposterous that companies went up in a war 
against this closing income statement. But they did. Now, uh, what I, I think I mentioned you this before, what's, uh, I think now we are back to like the big depression period whereby the information that companies publish is very, very limited. You know, this is an age of drill down, transaction measurement, extensive measurement of business, and we are providing information that is <coughs> LIFO, FIFO, uh, depreciation on a, on a fixed period basis. Uh, this is useless information, particularly in consolidated financial statements, because when you consolidate, you add apples and oranges. So GE has financial, for a little while, they're going to sell G capital, which is 40% of the business. You add a bank to industrial company, you finish with the nothing. So this kind of information is not a informational. And we are going to go back to the fact that uh, you can't really measure, you are not measuring business very well. Now there are things that you can't really fudge very well. Cash is not very fudgeable, correct? Yes, no. Receivables and payables are usually reasonably good numbers. Except for the fact that you have contracts that are obligations. And they are not reflected typically in your financial statements. So maybe the contracts have all these payments you have to do that don't reflect it in your financial statements. Or you might have some condition of giving up receivables under certain conditions with the client, and that's not in your financial statement. So the measurements became much worse uh, with the pass of time. And here it is, this incredible technology we have that can go from transaction to aggregate statements, cut it and, and paste it in many different directions, and is not being used in external reporting. Now, in internal reporting, the companies have these huge ERPs, SAP, or uh, several other ones, PeopleSoft, et cetera, et cetera, and companies are managing the company with all that stuff. And I think eventually there needs to be a compromise, social compromise between the right to know of the stakeholders, including stockholders, and what the company is willing to disclose. But at this moment, it's very tilted towards the company disclosing very little. So there's something for you to think. And what's happening in the public arena, this open data thing is fantastic. Because from one second to the other, there will be locations disclosing every transaction that they are doing. Now, there is going to be this huge lag, and this is all my prediction, doesn't mean I'm right, of course, that some people, like Joshua, will take his interest, instead of going playing golf, he's going to be <coughs> analyzing those financial statements, those bankings. And of course, it's not going to be only Josh for his great intentions is we are going to be other companies that compete and companies that sell to the government and companies that use the government trying to find some competitive advantage, understanding the bigger buyer of the world maybe is the government and maybe by understanding their spending patterns or by crying fault that the competitor is getting too many bids that they shouldn't. So there is all these very intricate Phenomena very difficult. But you know, it's very easy to say what should the quarterback have thrown on Sunday, on Monday. Oh, he shouldn't have thrown here, he should have thrown there. Because you know what happened. Okay? So when you, in 10 years, when you see these effects starting to come up, you say, oh, it was easy to predict. It. But it's not. Anything that's ahead of, it, ahead of us is very difficult to predict. Sometimes you predict a little bit better, sometimes you predict better. But this open data stuff, it's really going to influence things. One more interesting comment here for you. Um, State of New Jersey. This is University of New Jersey, correct? State of New Jersey is not very willing to disclose a lot of information. However, there is a law basically saying that any municipality has to disclose information someone asked them. So they were disclosing information in PDFs. Does everyone know what a PDF is? Mm -hmm. But PDF, you cannot data process easily. There are some software that can extract it, extracts text reasonably well, tables separately, is not very good. 
And a judge just recently said PDFs are not adequate. So now uh, municipalities, etc., are going to have to, to give it in Excel processable format, which you can transform to anything you want. So the world is changing, and actually you guys are in that cusp. And the other thing you are in the cusp is that there'll be a lot of business for auditors and for accountants on dealing with these disparate forms of data, on these analysis. I mean, it's a typical analysis for a, for a analytic scientist, or whatever they call it, of examining this. And the auditor is naturally an analytic scientist. This kind of auditors will change in what, you know, when we were talking over there, we are in ENY, they were saying that, oh, don't be sad, there'll be a lot of work for auditors, all will be employed. I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think uh, a lot of the manual things are going to be automated. Uh, however, I think there is a lot of jobs that are of higher intellectual caliber that will be in the hands of auditors, if the auditors play right. That's what we do in the uh, ASAC, Assurance Services Act Committee, we try to invent new services for auditors. Okay, so that was my little discussion of ENY and reporting. Now, I was a little bit worried last time that we talked that not all of you have enough technological background. So forgive me the ones that already understand this. I'm going to go very fast to some slides here, just to get, make sure we have a terminology. And I please, I ask you, particularly my international students, if you don't understand something, there's no embarrassment to say, can you repeat or explain? Because these things mount on top of each other. If you don't understand this, you won't understand this, you won't understand it. Ask it. Actually, it's, on the contrary, it's good to ask. Okay, so very rapidly, just to go over this, and sorry, my, these are old slides, I just decided to do this today. Um, first thing, this is your house. Okay, and your house used to be connected by the telephone. And the connection of your house is to a thing we call POPs line. Plain old telephone system line. What is that? That's a twisted copper pair. And many of you still have it that at home. Although many of you don't even have a POTS line at home, you just do something. Okay, now, on top of POTS line, twisted pair, they developed a high-speed broadband thing. It's called DSL. DSL stands for Digital Subscriber Line, but no one knows that. And actually, there are all kinds of variations, DSLX. XDSL, ADSL, except they all mean on top of a twisted pair copper transmission there is a broadband. And when you go and buy <coughs> broadband from your telephone company, you get DSL. And don't ask me the speeds because the speeds today go from very low to very high. And if you want to know the speed of your DSL line, get one of those speed, speed meter apps on your cell phone and go and try it. Or download it into your to laptop. That's the way to talk. Here I used to say speeds, etc. This just changed so much it's not even worth talking about this. Now, the other way of access to your to your computer is to the cable company. And that's not twisted pair, that's coaxial. It's basically one little wire and the layer lies kind of round thing. You've seen these things everywhere, okay? And uh, actually, Ethernet cabling is coaxial too. Um, now, the medium is either coaxial or twisted pair, but there is this thing now that's called fiber. And fiber is basically glass string that transmits much faster than coaxial or twisted pair. And um, well, um, markers. And typically, 
your house that my, my granddaughter has been using them. <laughs> okay? This is, a, this is your house. Typically, the distance between your house and the local distribution center is copper. And after that is typically fiber. And when you get to someone else's house, if you're connecting that way, it will be copper again. And there is this transmission, this conversion between analog. Analog is signal being transmitted like this, as opposed to digital signal transmitted 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, etc. And this fiber, this is copper. Okay? Uh, now, these days you get many other ways to your home. Uh, you could buy internet access from direct TV, correct? Satellite. Or there is a technology that's not used very much, fixed wireless, where there is like a pizza box size thing in your house and a transmission from up to like four or five miles directly to that. That's not being used very much, although in Texas they still have it. And of course, the more common one is cellular transmission to your house. Now, the speed of cellular is much lower than broadband transmission. Even if you are using the more advanced LTE or et cetera, et cetera, they are still very, very slow compared with broadband in your household. Is that okay with you? You understand this enough? Okay, next thing. So, this is summarizing pots, twisted pair, and coaxial. And the conduit is either fiber or copper or coaxial. And I explained what digital versus analog is. Um, just one comment, you might hear about low, traje uh, low trajectory satellites. There was this, uh, the way telephony works in the United States and in many other places, this is the US, okay, there are big, big switching stations, around 150 of them around the country. And they are interconnected. And when I was telling you about the story of the internet, they were afraid that someone bombs the sea and all these things, the interconnection disappear. That's why they created the internet. Um, but this was in the old days. Now there is an overlay of wireless all over. And, but the wireless captures things drops it into cable, and then it goes through cables. And there was this idea of circulating the Earth with satellites, low orbit satellites, and basically transmitting data in the low orbit satellites. And there were initiatives like Iridium, there were French one, there was several one, they were all went bankrupt. But they are still out there, and the US government bought most of Iridium because Satellite data transmission is very useful for warfare because you don't have the footpath of your transmission, you can transmit to anywhere you want. Okay, so you might hear about that uh, and this kind of interest. Okay, one more thing, and ignore this piece uh, much higher. Now, uh, basically the thing works that there is a, yes? Could you explain again what, or what is coaxial? Cable. Coaxial is a cable, basically one wire, and the, the thing that you connect your antenna of your TV. Okay. Okay? It's a little round cable with metal outside and what little string in the, in the middle. Okay. Okay? And that's typically what coaxial used to do, is transmit for you one set of signals from the cable company. And they develop a technology to mount broadband transmission on top of that particular cable. And typically, uh, 
broadband on top of coaxial is faster than DSL. Okay, so if you buy service from your telephone company, it's usually broadband, it's usually slower than if you buy from Time Warner, for example. Except for some of the telephone companies now put fiber into the loop. So the fiber goes all the way from here all the way to your house. And of course, those are much faster. Uh, it's a dedicated type of thing. Okay, and do ask. Okay, and basically, uh, when the internet was developed, remember I told you this little story, there were, there were several networks, and the idea was to link, that's why it's called internetworking, okay? And these guys here were, were the connectivity, okay? And today we call them backbone of the internet. It was, is like the, backbone of yourself. That's the core of the transmission. And the better way to think about this, I'm going to share a slide, is a one big fat cable here, and all the cables for smaller cables come out here. The backbone and the subsidiary table. In reality, there are many backbones of the internet, and many, many subsidiary cables. And remember, I told you, the internet, one of the things is you connect to two things every time, so if one crashes, you have the second one. So saying that the internet crashed is most of the time not always a misnomer. Typically, the internet browns down, meaning slows down, because you lose some of the connectivities. And when the internet started, you know, the commercial internet started, you used to get a lot of the phenomenon that you couldn't connect somewhere. And now you get it much less, because it became more reliable, and the technology. And these speeds here just exploded on you. Now they are talking about 100 gigabytes, one terabyte networks. Okay, I don't know if you heard, Google is providing an alternate internet service to a couple of cities. And it's a one gigabyte service. Okay, big. Okay, I already mentioned this last time, but I want to just go over this. What's the difference between packet switching and line switching? I said the packet, the line switching is, I pick up the phone, it goes to a switch, one line to the switch, this line is connected to a NAND line, so I talk to a NAND. Okay, so the whole line is occupied by my telephone calling to a NAND. My line and his line and one, one segment of the, cable, of the board in the, in the middle. Now we don't do that, we don't occupy lines except this little portion here between you and the switch. Okay? And what you actually do, you add the messages that you are saying, you break it in packets. And you throw the packets over the internet or over the packet switching network of your telephone carrier, and the packets go here, 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 and gets to the other place. And then it gets assembled, and I call that TCP IP, Transfer Control Protocol Internet Protocol, that aggregates the messages <coughs> for you. And so instead of occupying the line, you're occupying partially the line and your packets are going around. And that's what you do all around, around the internet. Um, okay, I've done that. Then I talked about internet protocols, IP numbers, and I told you that there is basically is four numbers, smaller than 256, and they will be, let's say, 1, 82, 15, 17, 1. And I also said to you that what's happening is that they are going to add two more segments to this thing so we don't run out of internet numbers. But if you kind of calculate how many 256 by 256 by 256 give, gives you a humongous number. There will be enough IP numbers for a long time, except for one thing. The demand will be very high because 
we are going to get the I of T, Internet of Things. And the Internet of Things is going to put an IP number in telephones, ovens, uh, cameras, all kind of things. Today, a large percentage, maybe 90, 92% of the internet communications between people and people. In the future, large percentage is going to be all object to object. Are we good up to here? Yes. Are you following the same dude? <laughs> the bird? Yes. Okay. Um, then I said one more thing to you is say, you get an internet name like yahoo.com or edu. This thing actually has an equivalent to a number like that. One. Okay, sorry, this is not lined up. Okay, and this is what's called a domain name server. And every time you're looking for a domain name, it goes to the server and picks up the number. The other thing I mentioned to you, there are these temporary IP numbers. When you connect into Rutgers, you borrow an IP number for a period of time. Yes? Why is it, you have said that um, the number has to be less than 256? Is there a That's reason? the standard. That, okay. The meaning is like, FASB tells you something. Okay. The international standard of telecommunications on IP basis created IP numbers with four digits smaller than 256 each. It's about two to the eight, that's the reason. It's binary and it's two to the eight, okay? And what they are doing is adding two more 256 maximum uh, elements. And here is the backbone, and the backbone has this affluences, forget about the speeds are very low, and there are providers attached to it. At the end of the providers might be you, might be a company. And I also mentioned to this last time, but to put in this context, in the old days, the US government paid for the transmission of data on the backbone. And what, uh, and what they do now is they basically pass it over to the NAPs, the people that, are, that have contact on the backbone, and they sell access to it. And you, I'm sure you have been all, uh, hearing about the story of internet neutrality. Have you heard about this? But you haven't figured out what it is, correct? It's, uh, it's the US organization that controls telecommunication is basically deciding that there will be no special fast lanes to the internet. So Google or Verizon cannot buy a piece of the public internet and give expensive service to someone different. Okay, so the idea is, and it's very, this sounds very easy, you know, everyone has the same speed, but in reality it's very difficult to specify this. And so the federal community, the FTC came out with all these rules recently of internet neutrality, but there was a lot of pondering about that, and President Obama had to interfere, although I don't think he understands what it is, <laughs> okay? But he interfered and said, yes, let's be neutral on the internet. And of course, this is floating to Europe, floating to Asia, and they have done their own things, so it's very interesting, this whole idea of internet neutrality. Um, just a couple of things. Obviously, each node has an identifier, which is the IP number. Um, each one can have content, and they have a domain name, and you can, okay, one more thing here. And you can have different types of equipment. It doesn't have to be one type of equipment. It can be any type of equipment uh, that, has been, uh, that has been developed for that purpose. Okay, so when you connect on the internet, okay, this is you, okay, and you don't visit a website, that's a misnomer. You ask for a page of the website. So you send an address, but the first thing is sending the address. I showed you that the domain names 
are these things. Actually, technically, this is the domain name. This is the subdomain. Typically, the third one is the name of a computer. Or it could be a service, but a computer. So Pegas Pegasus, Andromeda, uh, whatever we have here at Rutgers, those are computers at Rutgers. Dot Rutgers, that's the subdomain name, and EDU is the domain name. Other countries, domain name is like dot VR, that's Brazil. Okay, dot CA is Canada. But the US doesn't have dot US, the US has the domains. Com, EDU, etc. Now there are many, there is dot TV, dot this, dot that. Okay, and there is somewhere a computer that's a master of that domain, and it has a complete list of domain name servers and the IP numbers related to that. And if your local domain, for example, Andromeda here is a domain name server, if he doesn't know the number of that domain, it goes and asks the .com or the .edu or the uh, .net, what is the name of this domain? What's the number of this domain? So you are, when, so you are here, you're asking for my yahoo.com, this thing here, goes and asks the domain server the number. The domain server responds with a number. Okay, and from there on, if you have an address like myyahoo.com slash etc etc slash index, it replaces this with this number that I just, we just captured. And that way, when it's traveling to the internet here, this guy knows where to go. One more thing. Remember we broke the package. We broke the communication to packets. The packet has a header and has a content. The header has the address C, the address SOAR, and some other control thing. This thing cannot be encrypted. Because if you encrypt it, you don't know where to send it. So you only can encrypt the, con the content. Now, there are ways to anonymize, anonymize your IP number. But there are some servers on the internet designed to protect you against certain problems of identification. Okay? And this is kind of more hackerish type of thing. Um, but remember, what is encrypting is changing the content of something to gibberish. But you have to be able to decrypt it to be useful. Gibberish just continues gibberish unless you can convert it back. Are we good up to now? Yeah. Uh, so you said the IP address when I'm at Rutgers, I borrow it, right? So when I'm at home, is it, it's always the same? Yes. Is yes. Every time you have a, think about an IP number as a hole in the wall, Ethernet connection. That particular hole in the wall has one number. The company has one number. Okay. Now, internally, the company might divide that up in some way, but it's one number. And there are really two types of IP numbers: a permanent IP number, typically in a domain name server, and a variable number that is the one that you borrow, the ninth, uh, it's called dynamic IP allocation, and you borrow for a short period of time for your connectivity, typically wireless connectivity. For a while, 90% of the IP numbers are permanent. Now a small percentage of them are permanent, and a large percentage of them are borrowed for a period of time. The other thing is every country gets a certain set of IP numbers. Someone in that country divides the IP for Rutgers to the other university. Someone at Rutgers divides the IP to the schools and goes on and on and on. So there is very careful management of this. And people are very careful with this. Now, um, some countries decided to be a little bit liberal and invent duplicate IP numbers. Like the island of Tonga, T.O. And so they were confusing the entire internet. So actually they got disconnected from the internet. They didn't fool around with this particular thing because it ruined everyone's life. So that was resolved very 
very rapidly. So this, these rules of obeying the TCP IP protocol are very, very carefully obeyed and monitored. There are people that do this and accept. And although you think that I, the internet has an owner, the internet has many owners because there are these people that distribute the numbers and there are people that manage it and there are international rules of the numbers being allocated. But you know, understand, if you don't obey the rules, you don't only create a problem for yourself, you create a bigger problem for everyone else. So they are very tough in enforcing these rules. And of course, errors do occur. Now and then happens that a, a double IP number is created. So you found that place, you send this message, so you ask for IP. Typically, it's a page that you're asking. Basically, a screen image. Okay, then the server in the other side basically said, oh, he wants this page. And it sends the page to you in files. And one file might be a video file, the other file might be an audio file, the other file might be just the characters of the page, etc., etc. And these files get broken into packets. These packets are sent back to the original IP number, uh, and then the thing is TCP reassembles them. Are we good up to that? Just one comment is that if this is an email message or something that the content is very precious and has to be right, it waits until all the packets are put together. If this is a video stream or a picture where if most of the packets are there, you know what it is, it sometimes doesn't wait and just delivers it, renders it, uh, before it's finished. So sometimes you get a, a streaming video that the image is not very good. That means that the packets are being lost in, in, the, in the process. Okay, is this clarificatory, you understand? So for example, why when you connect on the internet the first time, try to go to some place you haven't gone before, takes a little bit longer. Because you have to download all the files and make initial connections? Even before that. Then you have to pass through the lines, means first time you have to make connection. You have to ask for the domain name the server name. for the number of that IP of that thing and then you send the message. Okay, other times it takes a long time because the server is busy. Other times it takes a longer time because uh, the internet in that sector is busy. So there are all kinds of reasons why this thing. And sometimes it happens that just a server is a bad or a small uh, server that's not doing very good service. Okay, just a couple more items of terminology. Uh, when you download one file, assemble the package into one file, you have a hit. However, a page might have more than one file. Most likely have 5, 10, 20 files. So one thing is not having one hit. If you download a page, you might have 5, 10, 20 hits. Now, a visit is when you go to a website, capture the data, or request the data from the website. And you keep requesting data from the website. Then you go to another website, your visit finished, and when you go there again, you have a new visit. But that's a little bit tricky, because if you just went out and rapidly came back, you're still connected. Keep your connection, uh, keep the, that IP number with you, and accept for your password. Uh, many, many websites require passwords. Why do they require passwords? Because they are precious content? Not really. They require a password to be able to identify when you come back. So they can do analytics. How many times Sophie went to that, to that website? And they can exchange information with other websites to see how many times Sophie visited there. And there are ways you can anonymize, but it's work. So that's the idea for trying to identify what a visit is. A visit is a unique 
entry that you stayed in a certain time of communication. That's a little bit tricky. Now, the other thing that is a visitor is a person that does a visit. And unique visitor is a person that not to be confused with the other one. So if you visited this website, then you go somewhere else, then you come back. You are not twice a unique visitor. You are once a unique visitor. And of course, it's very important to be able to link them. One more thing that you must have heard is called the cookie. OK? You visit a website, and you put your password in there. And what actually happens is that many of the websites deposit a cookie on your computer. So anytime you go to that website, you don't need to pass, type your password in there anymore because the cookie contains the password. And that's kind of convenient, correct? But it's a little bit tricky too because they can put other things in the cookie, like information about you, track, tracking information. You know, if you ran a software detector, a, problem, a bot detector, you sometimes see see this message, cookie collecting visitor information. And that's not too good because my reveal, the cookie stays there, see where you are going, and then tells the company where you are going. Uh, so you, you need a good virus detector to pick those things up and forbid them. Sometimes you allow them because you want some product that this company is giving you and they say it won't work well. So there's, it's kind of getting more complicated. Remember, privacy is gone. You are just not very interested. Okay, remember this, because every facility, a cookie is a very useful thing, but has the dark side. Everything is like that. Uh, just one comment here. And this is an old terminology, but the PPP slip is the, uh, is the variable IP allocation. And what it basically says here is that if you come from a fixed IP in your house, you are very easy to identify. You always have the same IP number. If you come in from Rutgers, every time you come in, you have a different IP number. That's why they need to ask you for an ID and a password to identify who you are. And of course, the identification is a big issue for better marketing, for why people provide a lot of free IP services. OK, now there is this thing called the firewall. And the firewall is basically a router sitting on the entrance of an environment protecting the environment. And you all have firewalls now at home, because your routers typically are firewalls. And you can make, uh, the firewalls can go from promiscuous to, per, to paranoid, meaning can be very, very protective, or they can leave everything open to go in. And so everyone has some kind of firewall, and you don't even know what the firewall is in there, because they come all pre-programmed, because you guys are not technical enough to do some configuration. But if you go into your router, configure your router at home, you might configure a tighter protection. But the moment you create a tighter protection, you're creating a lot of access problems. Some websites don't allow you, uh, don't allow you uh, to communicate with it unless you have a certain, for example, a very paranoid, um, very paranoid firewall doesn't let depositing of cookies. If you don't, can't deposit cookies on the website, don't let you in. So, that's the trade-off that they have. Now, remember also what I said before um, about technology. If you create technology that facilitates your life in some way, at the same time, you are creating potential problems, cyber attack problems, and etc. So the more you create a website to let your employees access remotely, to let your customers access remotely, what you actually are doing is creating an exposure. So give it take. So that's why very often companies create one website, one set of computers for 
clients to go in and the other side for your employees to be in internal and you know if you are in the federal government or you are in the intelligence communities you limit you limit compartmentalize create sections of things but the US government doesn't know that all the time because Mr. Snowden managed to download thousands and thousands and thousands of files. And before that, another gentleman uh, managed to bring in all hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cables from the Department of State for all embassies. So this is, uh, you know, as I said, sometimes the government is not very good at this. Okay, just terminology, what is DNS is a domain name server. That's the table that tells you the numbers of the IPs. Um, you heard this uh, HTTP, Hypertext <coughs> Transport Protocol, SSL, and so you have something like HTTP. HTTP. HTTP, you have that in front of the web names, correct? However, you can have also a little S in there, and that means secure. And so if you are dealing with a bank, or you are dealing with a purchase situation, make very sure you have the little S in there, or get out of there fast, because you might be in the wrong place. Okay, this is a way to use the SSL protocol to protect yourself, etc. Let's talk about this idea of delay. First, first question to you, for you to think a second about. Um, so in 15 minutes, we have a group presenting for half an hour. Okay, so first question to you, why is the economy becoming real time? Why are things being accelerated? Well, because with, with technology, it's a lot easier to get those, to get the data and have access to it. So there is a technology facilitation role. communication or transfer of information. So instead of having to wait for documents to be sent, it can be scanned or faxed. So should we write A, B is impatient? <laughs> <laughs> okay, it is communication, I guess. Uh, we're getting more data points, so we can, so focusing on broad trends, we can focus in on specific things like uh, when to sell something in a particular day of the week or even time of day. Any other discussion? All of these are factors, but I usually say the major factor is to decrease the occupation of capital. Decrease, that sounds like econom economics, correct? Occupation of capital. What does that mean? That you are always occupying capital. Correct? You are paying for labor hours. You have inventory in stock. You are paying for time of your buildings, etc., etc. Now, if you do something faster, you use inventory less time. You can turn the inventory faster. You use labor much less time. That's the most intuit intuitive. You use your offices less time. So, the most obvious reason or in a business environment to do things fast is because you spend less money on it. So, it's to decrease the occupation of capital. What will happen if one business takes months to do a particular process and the other business can do it in days or hours. The other the one that takes days or months to do it is going to end up 
going out of business. Yes, because his operations are going to be much more expensive. He's going to pay for much more inventory, he's going to pay for much more labor, etc., etc., etc. So we, uh, with this slide, I, dis I break down uh, latency. I mean, latency, the other word for delay, okay, into pieces. And the first one I call intra-process latency. Latency within a process means how long it takes you to do something. Okay, it could be a manual process, could be a computer process that is fast or is slow. So, electronization actually accelerates a process being done by putting technology in the process. Then there is this idea of inter-process latency. And what is inter-process latency? The time that it takes to transfer data between one process and the other process. Typically, most corporate uh, systems are one process, other process, other process. Some of them in parallel, some in sequence. And you keep passing data between them. And it takes a long time. In old days, you used to card punch. Pass it to the next system. They read it to their computers, get some output, card punch again, and pass it away. Very inefficient. So there was this kind of need to create an intercommunication protocol. What does that mean? The need to make two computers that never met understand each other, so you don't have to tailor each one to each other. So it, uh, there. W3C, we already talked a bit about this, World Wide Web Consortium developed this thing called XML, Expensible, Expensible Markup Language. <coughs> what was the purpose of XML? Is to create a jargon that you can transfer between data between two computers and not be able to every time have to define what that is. And what I described to you before, I said XML has over 300 jargons, and the one that we are more interested is called XBRL, Expensible Business Reporting Language. And when I started teaching, this was just an idea, this in here, and now is the law of the land, and most large companies need to prepare the financial reports in XBRL in addition to the traditional way. That's the good part of the story. The bad part of the story that the data in an XBRL report is exactly the same data that's in the financial report. So we didn't perfect our financial reports to give much more information. We just picked up inventory and called it inventory. Picked up cash, called it cash created a way so instead of someone retyping the financial statement into your Excel spreadsheet, you can press a button and it will translate it into your Excel spreadsheet. So that's good that accelerates things a little bit, but it's not really the interesting reporting that I was talking to you when we just started the class today. Okay. So, XML was an effort to accelerate inter-process latency. The other delay that we, we are talking about is the time that takes to make a decision. So you get the information, you study it, make a decision. Now, the way to accelerate decision-making latency is automating decisions. Isn't that the way to do it? And of course, I sent you, this one you got it, I sent you is your bookkeeper is going to be a robot. Correct? And what does that mean? Is that the things that are deterministic, meaning that they are very clear, if it's A, goes this way, if it's B, goes that way, if it's C, goes that way. Ultimately, you guys are not going to do it. It's going to be software that's going to do it. The robot, software robot. It's where there is complexity and human intervention necessary. 
And the other thing is where there is complexity and human intervention necessity. You have to observe it and maybe you can formalize it. And if you can formalize, you can put a robot to do it. It's all about a question of formalization. Either you formalize it by determinism A, B, C, D, or if it's more than 60% do this, if it's more than 40%, but not 60% do this, and et cetera, et cetera. So this is what kind of going to be the natural evolution of these systems. Progressively, more and more sophisticated pieces of software are going to emulate human decision making. And maybe uh, one of our PhD students or one of you will come in and develop algorithms that are better what a, that a human decision maker would do. And this is just kind of the natural evolution of things. Now, you learn, and you are probably learning at this moment, a lot about bookkeeping entries, correct? Now, are you ever going to do a bookkeeping entry? Very rarely. Certainly not at the beginning of your careers. Why? Because the today you identi identify, this is a sale, the computer does the bookkeeping entry for you. Okay, it may be adjusting entries at the closing of a period in a very complex situation with new rulings of the FASB, you might have to do bookkeeping entry. But then you'll be a manager or a partner or you'll be a high level um, controller that you're going to have to do those things. And there'll be some people that will be specialized on high level complicated bookkeeping entries. All the big four have uh, these uh, accounting standards lines that if you run into a problem with some bookkeeping entry, you call them up and say, in this case, what do I do? So, and what has happened is that progressively, more and more of these things became formalized. Now, it's great because you don't do this meaningless, mindless bookkeeping stuff. It's not so great because there'll be less jobs for accountants. But I don't, didn't expect any of you with master's degrees to become accountants to do bookkeeping. So don't look so sad about this. But could change, meaning uh, it could be that even the complex bookkeeping entries are done. And then there is this whole process, once a decision made, how to implement it. And it's possible that your system go here, stop here, you make a decision, then the implementation is automatic. It's possible. Okay, let's get started. Good afternoon, everyone. Mike Altieri, head of ISP Policy. Jim Willis. And we will be discussing the IT issue of NSA snooping and Edward Snowden. <laughs> Those who <laughs> give up their essential liberties for a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. That was said by who? Benjamin Franklin. <laughs> <laughs> and he's the inventor of what? And don't tell me it's the light bulb. Maybe that was Thomas. Electricity. <laughs> Do you agree with this quote? You know, I you know, I, there always has to be a balance between, you know, security and freedom, and and I think that it does swing back and forth. I think Franklin here and and kind of the way we've traditionally been in the United States is to value the freedom over the security and things have started to give way in the last few years. And so I kind of tend towards saying we should go back to where we prize our liberty a little bit over the security. So a compromise needs to be made. So we'll see how everybody's responses to this question evolves by the end of our presentation today. Okay. Um, what is NSA snooping? It is defined as the governmental surveillance of the American people. My team in particular chose to discuss this issue of NSA snooping 
because of the potential dangers of governmental overreach and abuse. The implications of NSA snooping is far reaching because if left unchecked, our fundamental rights to freedom and personal privacy could be completely abolished. We all are aware that there are bad apples in any organization, so we cannot singularly condemn NSA for any undesired consequences that resulted from the enactment of the Patriot Act in 2001. This act itself was initially created as a response to the World Trade Center bombings to protect the American people from foreign terrorists. And that is a good thing, right? Yes. <laughs> as with many worthwhile, though potentially invasive endeavors between two parties, there is an inherent conflict that exists between two rights in a civil society the right to individual freedom and privacy versus the right to public and national safety, both of which are guaranteed by the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights to the American people. Obviously, compromises between the two rights need to be made, as um, Josh so eloquently stated. But how do we determine the extent that we permit the governmental interference into our rights to personal privacy and individual freedoms versus balancing protecting the American public from legitimate national threats to American lives. Must one right necessarily mean we must forego the other right? If I were to tell you that once you stepped into this auditorium, you had implicitly agreed to allowing my team and myself the automatic right to collect all your cell phone data, including text messages and emails, and compile various data and analyze you from them, what would you say, Abby? Um, I wouldn't like that. <laughs> <laughs> would you be in an agreement with what we do? Would you consent to having us take your personal data and amass it for the sake of public safety of Rutgers Business School community? Or do you consider it a violation of your rights as a private citizen and also as a student at Rutgers to maintain some semblance of your personal right to privacy and space and freedom. NSA, NSA snooping can be considered a governmental overreach, but it is also a reflection of the practical reality of the dangerous world we live in. Hence, recently with the expiration of Section 215 in the Patriot Act of 2001, there was a new law enacted called the U.S. Freedom Act of 2015, which limits the powers of the NSA. Like we'll be discussing this later. I have also recently been informed by a friend in high places within the military that the NSA now has something called a privacy officer. This means that they have decided to create an independent oversight committee within the NSA itself, which will oversee everything that is collected from the American public and presumably restrained and prevented from abusing its own authority and power. Having said that, who has never heard of the NSA? for National Security Agency. Here's, it's an intelligence organization of the US government responsible for SIGNOS intelligence, also called SIGINT. SIGINT functions global monitoring, collection, processing of information and data for, for foreign intelligence and counterintelligence purposes. NSA is also charged for protecting US government communications and information systems against penetration and network Warfare. Okay, some of NSA methods. Many NSA programs use passive electronic collection. NSA is authorized to use active clandestine means that means secretive, um, um, something that the public might not be knowledgeable about. Physically plugging electronic systems, allegedly engaged in sabotage through subversive software. The NSA maintains a global presence um, throughout the world and it has a special collection service where they can um, insert eavesdropping devices on various people, including its own citizens. Close surveillance, bur burglary, wiretapping, breaking and entering are some of the reasons and rationale that it uses um, to 
justify what it does. Unlike the Defense Intelligence Agency and the Central Intelligence Agency, both of which specialize in foreign and human espionage, NSA does not unilaterally conduct human source intelligence gathering, despite often being portrayed so in the popular media. NSA is entrusted with coordination and assistance from other sick and governmental organizations, and those other organizations are prevented by law from engaging in their activities unless with the express approval of the NSA via the Defense Secretary. To streamline such responsibilities, the NSA works closely with the Central Security Service and both are involved in crypto analysis. The NSA Director concurrently serves as the Commander of the U.S. Cyber Command and as Chief of the Central Security Service. A little history historical context for the NSA. NSA was originally um, originated as a unit to decipher coded communications in World War II, and it was officially formed as the NSA by Harry S. Truman in 1952, so it's been around for a while. Since then, NSA has become one of the largest of the U.S. intelligence organizations in terms of personnel and budget. The NSA operates as part of the Department of Defense and reports to the Director of National Intelligence. Okay, the NSA controversy in Snowden. M NSA surveillance has been a matter of political controversy, such as spying on prominent anti-Vietnam War leaders or economic espionage. In 2013, the extent of the NSA's secret surveillance programs was disclosed to the public by Edward Snowden. According to the okay, according to the leaked documents, the NSA inter intercepts the communications of over a billion people worldwide, tracks the movement of hundreds of billions of people using cell phones. NSA also conducts domestic surveillance of internet traffic of foreign countries um, through the system called boomerang routing. Who is this man? Snowden. Snowden. Excellent. Really <laughs> great at the end. Okay. Who is Edward Snowden? Snowden was an American computer professional, former CIA employee, and government contractor who leaked classified information from the U.S. NSA in 2013. The information revealed numerous global surveillance programs, many run by the NSA and the Five Eyes, with the cooperation of telecommunication companies and European governments. Many of these spy programs have been questioned as to their legality and scope and possible abuse. Timeline of Snowden and his leaks and figures. Abbreviated timeline. 2006, um, he was hired by the CIA as a technical IT expert and receives top secret clearance. Between 2007 and 2009, he um, posted to Geneva, Switzerland, under diplomatic cover as an IT and cybersecurity expert for the CIA, a position that gives him wide access to classified documents. During this period, Snowden had an epiphany and he says he became disillusioned about the government and what he was doing. He said, I realized that I was part of something that was doing far more harm than good. So late in 2009 to March 2012, his supervisor suspected that Snowden was breaking into classified computer files during work, and which he has no access to. So ultimately, he was forced to leave the company. He moves to Hawaii to work at an NSA facility. Um, Snowden leaks to the journalist sometime between December 2012 and um, May 20th, 2013. So he and the journalist arrive in Hong Kong from Hawaii. Okay, the first disclosure of uh, Snowden's files by Snowden himself was published in the Guardian, Guardian article about the NSA collection of domestic email and telephone metadata from Verizon. And it was later revealed that 
it was part, only a small part of a larger, much uh, collective effort. Um, okay. And then the Guardian and Washington Post on June the 6th, 2013, published an article regarding PRISM, which is an NSA program which forces the biggest US internet companies to hand over data on domestic users. That means you guys. June, June the 9th, 2013, The Guardian reveals that Edward Snowden is the source of the US, uh, the NSA leaks. So this is like the beginning of the end for Snowden in the US. So he quickly becomes a fugitive. Um, June 14, 2013, the US Justice Department charges Snowden with theft, unauthorized communication of national defense information, and willful communication of classified Basically, they charged him with treason, which um, is a capital offense, and it could be punishable by death penalty. So it's a very serious crime, so you've got to be careful. You know, you see you out, it's more public. Um, okay. um, Snowden leaves Hong Kong for Ecuador, but is uh, retained there. And then he is granted temporarily asy asylum by Russian authorities in August 2013. Dirty Tricks and Money Traps, a beautiful surveillance program. On February 7, 2014, um, at least he news reports uh, used Snowden's documents to extract information about dirty tricks that are used by the British spies for use against nations, hackers, or groups, suspected criminals, and arms dealers. And, um, and then also, at the same time, to potentially release computer viruses. So they spy on journalists and diplomats, jamming phones and computers, and using sex to lure targets into what are called honey traps. <coughs> okay, there are financial repercussions due to the Snowden leaks. I mean, that's evident, right? March 6, 2014, the Pentagon estimated that it needed to spend billions to counteract the damage done to the military security by Snowden's leaks of intelligence documents. Legal, financial, and national security ramifications to Snowden, the NSA, the U.S. government, and the American public is a result of the NSA's snooping by such people as Snowden. This illustrates that NSA snooping is not a simple, transparent, trivial matter. Indeed, it produces grave consequences to all involved and makes us question what is right versus wrong and to differentiate what is legal versus what is moral as well. Okay, so now we're gonna recap. Those who would give up their essential liberties for a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. So with that, I'm gonna give it over to Mike, who's gonna discuss the law. NSHBB. So I'm gonna talk about the United States Surveillance Program. You guys are probably wondering, you know, what are you, what's being spied on in this country? So the PRISM, that's what I'm going to start off with. It's the United States Government Surveillance Program. It was launched in 2007 under the Protect America Act in the uh, George Bush administration. As you guys know, it was leaked under Snowden. So what exactly is PRISM? PRISM is a system that the NSA uses to gain access to private communications. Um, it's intended for foreign countries and foreigners um, that's up for debate. Uh, the program collects internet communications from companies such as Google, Verizon, Facebook, Skype, AOL, and Apple. Um, from, the, from the current providers that I just mentioned up there, they take your email, your videos, uh, photos, stored data, chat, file transfers, video comps, pretty much everything you do online can be compromised. By the NSA. Um, so they're key targets, but they're really they're really not out to get like the <clears throat> the average person. They're really just out to get you know to for in different countries. They're after Venezuela, military procurements, um, people in oil, basically wherever there's money, um, Mexico, narcotics, energy, internal security, and political affairs. And then they're also in Colombia for trafficking and FARC, 
Uh, if you guys aren't familiar with FARC, it is like the ISIS of Colombia. It's like a militant group. So, you know, that's something they want to keep an eye on. And a lot of people, you know, they get it. They're all for it. They say, you know, if my information might be compromised for the public safety, then it's fine. And, you know, that's, that, that's one side of the coin. So back to PRISM. So what PRISM is, it's, you know, it's the system that that's spies on people, basically. It's an espionage system, collects your data. And there's three, pretty much three different views to this system. From the Obama administration, they say it's tactically, they tactically acknowledge the program, which means that, you know, they say, yeah, it exists. Uh, you guys have to be aware of it, just so you know, it's out there. And that's all they really tell you. They don't really get into, really don't talk about it much more than that. Uh, a lot of the companies that were listed two slides earlier, the big data um, internet companies, the, they deny working with the government. They issued all kinds of statements saying, you know what, we, we have no idea what PRISM is. We, they, we have, you know, it's not us, whatever it is. Um, and then guys like Snowden, who Snowden obviously leaked the information, he finds it to be dangerous and criminal activity. So that's pretty, pretty far extreme. Um, as opposed to the Obama, which is, you know, protect, protect, protect. So here's Google's uh, CEO, Larry Page. He founded Google, this guy. And this is an exact quote. If you Google NSA Larry Page, he says, what the dot, 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 you can imagine what comes next. And then he goes into a huge statement and says, you know, this is not right. Um, we are, we're not giving any information to anybody. You know, this is all the government. That's it. Um, he basically wants nothing to do with PRISM. And every single company that I listed before, plus a couple others like Dropbox, um, pretty much any internet provider, they say the same exact thing. They don't want anything to do with PRISM. So what does the president say? He's, like I said, he said acknowledge it. He said, you know, you guys gotta deal with it. We have to, we have, he's got a job to protect people in this country and you know, there's not much he can do about it because he needs to see what's going on. Um, and he also tells people, reassure, it doesn't apply to Americans. It's really about the people overseas uh, that are trying to attack us that we're really interested in. And it's all part of this job to protect the American people. That leads to another, another story. There's these spy agencies. And what these spy agencies are is the NSA agents have channeled their eavesdropping capabilities and have turned it into, you know, um, different using it for a different reason other than protecting people. So for instance, um, an NSA agent has a, has a login to, to the database. He can go in and look up, you know, say his girlfriend was out late last night. He can go in and see like what she was texting, what she was emailing last night. So it's, you know, it's kind of something that they need to really strap down on and I don't know how they're gonna do it. Um, and you know, the NSA, they say, you know, it only happened a handful of times, which you can believe that, you can not believe it, whatever you want. Um, but here are some, there's love interest, what I just mentioned, uh, sign it, which is signal intelligence, human it, which is human intelligence, AKA spying. Um, and then, you know, any agent that's caught is reprimanded and probably terminated. The only issue is that most of the, um, most of the times they were caught, it was because some scandal erupted and they had to kind of come forward and say it. So most incidents were self-reported. And that brings me to Keyscore. So Keyscore is a, it was supposed to be a secret computer system used by the United States for NSA searching and analyzing uh, global internet data. So they collect data on a daily basis and it's assumed to have unlimited capabilities. Uh, we don't really know exactly what they collect, so we assume that they collect everything. So where is Keyscore? It's located everywhere. It's all, I don't know if you can see this laser pointer. Is it? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, mostly in this area right here. Um, not working, but yeah, not working. <laughs> Europe, uh, Central America, like I mentioned, they're after far. The Middle East looks like it's pretty red. Um, and then areas in New York and, and the borders. So that's where Keyscore is located. I think they have 150 so data hubs around the world. Um, and this is just how that operates. So you're probably wondering how does Xcore have access to all these databases around the world? And the way they do it is, so there's this F6 special collection service 
That's a joint operation with the CIA and the NSA that carries out class one operations, including espionage and foreign diplomats. Um, so they basically intercept communications that are going back and forth. They'll go in and say, say for foreign sat, which stands for foreign satellite, they'll you know, go into the wire and split it and collect the, the data that way. Um, think of a, a direct line from here to there and then someone in the middle cutting it and then routing it that way. So all the information is being filtered into X key score. Um, and then there's SSO division and that's for telecommunications. So I thought this was interesting that um, much of the world, this is actually a slide from, that was leaked by Snowden, I believe. So what he's saying is that most of, so when you make a phone call, it doesn't make necessarily the most direct line to, to me, to the next person. It takes the cheapest line. And what America has done is driven down the price of these channels between these different countries. So if you make a phone call from Asia to Africa, it doesn't necessarily go from Asia to Africa. It goes to the United States, to Europe, to Africa. It could go all the way around. And that is the way that the United States, they figured out, you know, we can make our lines cheap and collect this information. And it's, you know, there's not really much anybody can do about it. Um, so yeah, I thought that was an interesting slide. So this is a um, key score according to the NSA. Uh, they think it's part of their lawful obligation to collect this information to, uh, Make sure there's no unchecked analyst that has you know access to these databases. They know exactly who's in it at all times. Who knows who's monitoring the people who are watching the people in the database? But that's a different story. Um, so they access limited to personnel, and they know exactly who is on which task. So that's one way they they kind of calm people down. So X key score according to Snowden. Now he's got a completely different view on this. He says it's a one-stop shop to access to all of the NSA's information. Uh, they track all information in real time. If you're sitting there on your email, they could be watching you as well if they, if they really want to. And it also alerts if any activity is, is showing up from an IP address. So someone that they know is you know, making a phone call, they'll, they'll get a ping and they, they get to see what he's doing. Um, another question Snowden brings up is how do you protect the source code? Say somebody, you know, everything's hacked nowadays. You read every, every day in the paper you read a new thing is hacked. What if this is hacked to somebody and somebody gets their hands on it who's not supposed to have it? You know, it's going to it's gonna be a problem. So that's Snowden's point. Um, these are other global surveillance systems. I can't get too far into them, but there's Echelon, you know, read all the lists all the way down. This is just to prove the point that there's probably a lot we don't even know. This is what we can get off the internet. They probably know everything they, they really want. Um, so with that being said, it's okay to assume that no one's data privacy is 100% protected anymore. And uh, like the professor said, you, know, you just have to assume that you're, they don't care what you're doing. So hopefully no one's doing any shady activity. And uh, that's it. Just two comments before. Uh, the first thing is, it's not totally sure that what you said is correct, that uh, if you're texting or email, they have access to it. What they claim, there was a there was a 60 minutes piece where the first time they opened the door of the NSA and the head of the NSA talked to me. And then he, he claimed that they only collect the metadata, which is data about data. And we're going to talk about metadata and you know what, when my AT&T Bell Labs days, what they call metadata was data. Meaning they don't not collect the actual utterances or verbal utterances of the data, but they're collecting who called who and when. So if you're talking about checking on your girlfriend, at least you knew who she called. Okay, okay. now I don't know how much they're collecting on, on text. The other thing is they are, their charter is to collect information on foreigners. But if the foreigner is of suspect nature and talking to American, they collect information on, on the Americans. Okay, again, we don't know very well. This is such a good presentation, I'm going to have to do much less in my NSA lecture. And there is one thing, they, they showed Greenwald and Pointers. Uh, you mentioned Greenwald and Pointers. They are reporters at what Snowden did, uh, Snowden did. He went to them and said, tell my story. 
and he was in Hong Kong at that time. And there is a documentary that point was put together, and you can see it any flight, pretty much. They have it there. And it's actually, it's worth watching. And you know, you look at the guy, he seems pretty sympathetic. He could be one of you, could be one of my students. Young, pretty good looking. He was moaning about losing his girlfriend, but then she joined him. And uh, it's actually uh, interesting. And the other thing is, yeah, she mentioned the U.S. Freedom Act of 2015, which basically curtailed some of the NSA capabilities from the Patriot Act. You can give uh, Snowden some credit for that, correct? So at least he opened the dialogue. And you guys are too young to remember this, but there was a group of people that invaded the, off the Philadelphia offices of the FBI. Um, and it, this was uh, somewhere after the Second World War. And uh, they stole a lot of documents. And uh, they basically created a big debate in Congress about the power of the FBI. And uh, actually finish up that Hoover was kicked out. Hoover had all kinds of personal information, a lot of affairs of, uh, of congressmen, and he did a lot of blackmailing. If you see the film Hoover, you, you'll see that in the film. And uh, so they create these guys who actually never were caught, uh, created a big debate in Congress about, about what is the, should be the power of the government. And they changed the laws. Uh, five, ten years later, they changed a lot of the laws. Um, and these guys, when they, I think the statute of limitation elapsed, a few of them went to the New York Times and started talking about it maybe last year. A few already had died and etc. It's very interesting to think about uh, what it takes to keep freedom. It's, it's very interesting. This, uh, you know, not uh, in favor of Snowden and not against Snowden. I just think this is something we need to understand, that this is affects our business life and our individual life. It's very interesting. I didn't mean to interrupt it, but I just wanted to, before I forgot, make these two comments. Thank you. Uh, the documentary Dr. Castellari was talking about is Citizen Four. It was really interesting. Say that again. Citizen Four. Citizen Four.